He's the author of the threat matrix inside Robert Mueller's FBI and the War on Global Terror. Uh, his book came out in 2011. It documented the FBI's evolution into an international security agency. Uh, he's in Cambridge today visiting the Harvard's uh, Shorenstein Center to discuss Robert Mueller's investigation. A lot of questions about it, obviously. And he is currently the director of the Aspen Institute Cybersecurity and Technology Program. What was it about Robert Mueller that fascinated you? So I started uh, this project in the summer of 2008, uh, at which point Bob Mueller was just about to become the longest serving FBI director uh, since J. Edgar Hoover himself. And, and what interested me in that moment was actually the fact that he was the last national security figure in the same job from 9-11, that he had uh, he, he started uh, as FBI director on September 4th, 2001, and actually was seated on the morning of September 11th, that Tuesday morning, uh, getting his first briefing on Al-Qaeda and the bombing of the USS Cole, which had happened the year before. And uh, his day was interrupted by the news that the World Trade Center had been struck. And that sort of reshaped his entire, the entire rest of his term and, and the country, obviously, in, in many ways. Do you know if Robert Mueller ever came across the name Carter Page? It's possible. It, w it was one of the most high profile FBI counterintelligence investigations, uh, really since the end of the Cold War, uh, where you had uh, the FBI go after a trio of uh, Russian intelligence officers uh, from the SVR, sort of the Russian equivalent of the CIA, uh, including uh, Viktor Podobny, Igor Sporyashev, and Yevgeny Buryakov, uh, who actually was arrested himself uh, in January 2015 and became the first Russian intelligence officer to serve time in federal prison uh, in at least 50 years. I mean, this was an unprecedented case as it was unfolding. Uh, and, and as you said, it, you know, those of us who have been following this for a while, we remember Carter Page uh, as unidentified male number one. In fact, as we've learned uh, recently from Time Magazine, uh, that uh, in an article for Time Magazine, among others, uh, that he, in fact, bragged about uh, his uh, relationships at that point, Cor correct? Yeah, absolutely. And this is part of, uh, you know, what is really a uh, fascinating constellation of uh, unexplained and suspicious contacts between figures close to the Trump campaign and both Russian nationals and Russian officials. Um, you know, most famously, obviously, the, the Trump Tower meeting with Don Jr., Jared Kushner, uh, Paul Manafort, um, and a handful uh, of Russian uh, nationals, in, uh, including one uh, uh, Russian lawyer uh, who went on to have very close ties to numerous Russian oligarchs uh, around Vladimir Putin. We're going to come back to that in a second. I want to co come back to uh, go back to Robert Mueller. Uh, mm -hmm. Robert Mueller, the uh, the investigator. Robert Mueller, the FBI director. Uh, Robert Mueller, the uh, the Vietnam hero. Mm -hmm. uh, let's talk about him for a second. Uh, Robert Mueller uh, is, uh, as I've been sort of saying over the last year, probably America's straightest arrow. He is someone who has worked at the Justice Department uh, for the better part of 50 years now. He volunteered to serve, volunteered to become a Marine, volunteered to go to combat, uh, led a platoon into uh, combat in Vietnam. Uh, he came back from Vietnam and has spent most of the rest of his career as a prosecutor, uh, working his way to the top of the Justice Department, actually not once but twice. After stepping down from that post at the end of the Bush administration, the first Bush administration, rejoined as a line prosecutor the D.C. U.S. Attorney's Office, um, sort of stepping down uh, from leading the entire country's criminal uh, division to taking a job that was about the equivalent of someone two or three years out of law school uh, just because he so loved being a prosecutor. That was what drove him, sort of that sense of uh, and quest for justice uh, and, and law and order. Yet, almost half the country uh, believes that there's something negative about this man's background. It, it, it really is sort of a, a fascinatingly strange world for uh, those of us who have followed, followed Mueller's career uh, over, uh, over the last decade. You know, in 2013, 
uh, or 2011, when his original 10-year term as FBI director was up, uh, he was nominated by President Obama to stay on an extra unprecedented two years, and uh, that required a special act of Congress that passed the U.S. Senate 100 to zero. I mean, this is uh, one of the most respected public servants in Washington, seen as intensely nonpartisan, intensely apolitical. Um, I, I think what, what we do know about Bob Mueller uh, as a uh, public servant is that this is not someone who is inclined to go on fishing expeditions. Uh, when you sort of look back over the course of his career, he tends to interpret his charge uh, in, in any given situation in sort of the most narrow by the book four corners of the page uh, that he can. What are the next steps? You wrote a piece recently um, uh, for Wired, which is uh, quite interesting. Uh, Bob Mueller's investigation is larger and further along than you think. How much further along than we think? Well, one of the things to think about, which I talk about in the, in the piece, is uh, we talk of the Mueller probe as if it's sort of a one thing, a single entity. Uh, but it's in fact at least five different probes in one, sort of examining different uh, buckets of allegations, different types of criminal charges and criminal behavior. Uh, first of all, you, you have uh, sort of past business dealings and, and money laundering, uh, which is the part of the investigation that has already led to indictments against former campaign chairman Paul Manafort and former campaign aide Rick Gates. The second bucket of investigation is uh, the uh, effectively sort of the Russian bots and trolls that we saw on Twitter, on Facebook. The third bucket of the investigation, also related to the hacking of the election, if you will, is the active cyber intrusions, which were specific operations carried out by the Russian FSB and the GRU. Uh, the two of their intelligence agencies uh, to penetrate the Democratic National Committee, the DCCC, uh, to, to penetrate actually Rus uh, Republican websites as well. Uh, then the fourth bucket uh, is those Russian campaign contacts that we, we were talking about. Um, and this is the part of the investigation that has already led to two separate guilty pleas by George Papadopoulos and Michael Flynn, the former national security advisor. And then fifth and last, uh, and, and again, totally separate in many ways from the rest of this investigation, is sort of the big one, which is the only one that we're really talking about day to day, which is the obstruction of justice investigation of the president himself and aides in the White House as to whether uh, President Trump uh, attempted to obstruct justice when he asked uh, FBI Director Jim Comey to quote unquote look past the investigation of Michael Flynn uh, or, or when Jim Comey refused to do that, uh, did Trump obstruct justice through firing Jim Comey? We, we've seen the Manafort um, uh, layers of this being, uh, uh, being deciphered and put together in the media. We've seen uh, uh, Michael Flynn, his relationship. Michael Cohen, uh, that still seems to be a question mark about the relationship with Felix Slater and the type of project that they were considering uh, in, uh, in 2016. Can you talk about that and, and, and explain where the connection to the next phase of the Mueller investigation, perhaps that which is not known? One of the things that has been most surprising about Bob Mueller's investigation has been the extent to which Bob Mueller has surprised us. You know, this is the most closely analyzed, mm -hmm. most closely followed investigation in American history. And yet at every turn, Bob Mueller has known more than we think he does. And, and, and in fact, uh, you know, we saw in his first public move uh, last year, this surprise arrest uh, uh, of George Papadopoulos, that not only had George Papadopoulos been arrested several months earlier, but he had cooperated and he had pleaded guilty uh, no, with no one in, uh, in the media having any sense that he was even uh, in play in the investigation.
So now, when you look at the investigation, I think one of the most important things to understand is knowing what we know that Bob Mueller hasn't told us yet, and that there are at least two very major pieces of evidence in this investigation that we know about that haven't been made public, which is the information that George Papadopoulos traded for his plea deal and his cooperation with prosecutors, and the evidence that Michael Flynn uh, received for his cooperation and his plea deal, uh, neither one of which has been made public by Mueller's investigation, but both of which we know were significant enough that Bob Mueller provided uh, George Papadopoulos and Michael Flynn with very lenient plea deals. And, and I think it's really important to understand, uh, you know, that, you know, we don't know where that investigation is going to go at this point and it, where those pieces of evidence might lead. But we know that Bob Mueller knows them and we know that Bob Mueller uh, thinks that they are central to his investigation. So I think that that's the area that's most interesting to watch, is when are we going to find out what George Papadopoulos and Michael Flynn traded? That significance and the timeline you're discussing, it should be fascinating to every American. For one, uh, this is proceeding along a parallel track as the uh, as uh, Representative Nunes' uh, quote-unquote investigation uh, into the FBI, uh, starting with his uh, now infamous memo. Uh, uh, that excoriated the FBI. So the question becomes, who wins out first? Who, which information transcends uh, uh, in, the, in the public sphere? It, it depends a little bit. Uh, you know, we just have no sense of what the timeline is, except that we do know that Bob Mueller is seeking to interview President Trump, and, and that that would lead one to believe, under sort of normal federal jurisprudence, that Bob Mueller is pretty close to the end of at least that part of the investigation. Which explains the race. Which well, explains perhaps the race that we are, we're seeing sort of play out right now, which is uh, uh, that Bob Mueller feel, you know, you're, you only get one bite at the apple if you're interviewing the President of the United States. And so if Bob Mueller is ready to ask for that, that means that Bob Mueller is confident that he knows everything that he needs to know. So that could be a sign that this investigation could move very quickly uh, from this point forward. But at the same time, uh, it's important to, to recognize that even if this investigation doesn't do anything more than the four cases that it has already brought, Paul Manafort, Rick Gates, Michael Flynn, and George Papadopoulos, you're looking at an ongoing investigation that would probably last a year, a, a year or two. And it's notable that uh, this week, uh, you saw President Trump's uh, budget proposal for next year come out, and he's expecting in fiscal year 2019, which doesn't begin until October 1st, mm -hmm. that Bob Mueller is going to be around and spending $10 million to run another year of the investigation. Garrett, thank you very much. Uh, Garrett Graff, folks, uh, extraordinary, extraordinary inform information. Thanks so much for having me. Much appreciated.